service here at Victory Springs, and we had a good crowd this morning, a good service for Easter service morning. I think some people kind of made their way in and then wore themselves out. If you've had this sickness, then uh, I, I, you know what it is to do something out and about and then to get home, and some of them are probably still sleeping. And so, But I, I know for me, I um, after being down for a week and dealing with the sickness that I was dealing with, and then I went and unloaded the groceries. We went and got groceries, and I unloaded them, and I was ready just to go back to bed for the rest of the day. And uh, But it'll knock you down for sure, so appreciate you being here tonight. Looking forward to our youth night, our youth service. Service. And so the youth are going to be doing uh, most of the different things tonight within the service. So I'm excited. I got Caleb Peel's going to lead the singing for us tonight. So, Caleb, if you would stand with me, Caleb, come tell us what that first number is. Hey. Would you play, please stand with me and grab your hymn book and turn to page 152? Christ arose. grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he rose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain. With his saints to reign, he arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus, my Savior. Vainly they steal the dead, Jesus. dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his prey, Jesus my Savior. dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Amen. 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 That's a nice, tough high song to lead to start off amen but I, I told him i said you pick the hymns tonight and he picked it i said man all right throat stretcher we're gonna have a good time all right let's go ahead and pray tonight the lord to bless, bless our services and uh, looking forward to a great evening with you heavenly father lord we thank you for being the god and proving it by resurrecting from the dead Lord, we're so thankful that you would be willing to come and that you would die for our sins and make a way for us to be able to go to heaven. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us and help us tonight. I pray that you'd give us something from your word that would speak to us and that would challenge us and that, Lord, would just truly bless us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We've got the youth choir, and uh, Miss Cam, if you want to get them in order for that, and they're going to go ahead and sing a special at this time for, from the youth choir.
happen. That's right. I was sick in my body. I could not get well. <coughs> the doctors had told me all they could tell. Then the great physician passed by my way. Oh, I know the Lord is good. Now I have a story that I like to tell of how Jesus saved my Amen. Thank you for that youth choir. What a wonderful special. The Lord truly is good. What a blessing that is. It's good to have tonight, I, th I believe, Miss Debbie. Thank you for being with us tonight. Came with Mrs. Beasley. And so thank you for visiting in our services this evening. Had a wonderful service this morning. I had an opportunity after the service to be able to meet with Brandon. And Brandon trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior this morning. What a wonderful blessing. And uh, so thankful for that. Best decision you'll ever make. And uh, it's a wonderful thing thing when somebody gets saved. Never get over uh, that day that you got saved. That'll change your life as it should. God does a great work in that. Uh, we've got tomorrow night, 7 p.m., we've got our revival night with Brother Brian Stanley and his family. They'll be coming in. They'll be singing, I believe, four songs, and, and uh, then he'll be preaching for us. It's going to be a, a, a night to come to, so you're going to want to be here. That'll be at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. We don't normally have services on Monday night, but we do for this particular Monday, and so it's going to be a good service. I want you to be here, and so let's make it an effort to be here just to support him. I know he's excited for the opportunity to be able to preach. Uh, the Owls have an activity April 6th. That'll be this Saturday, and then please see Miss Cammy for that ladies' conference. It'll be in Middleburg April 19th through the 20th, and she will need to know who wants to come to that ladies' conference, and she'll need to know that by the end of next Sunday. You can see her for more details on that. That's all the announcements I'm going to give. And uh, I'm leading the service, and you know me, I, I don't like announcements. They make me nervous. And so I've got uh, Brother Nate, though, if you would. Brother Nate, make your way this way. Brother Nate just came back from a trip to Africa and helping the, win some missions efforts there in Africa. So he's going to give us a short update on how that trip went. Thank you, sir. Man, he doesn't like announcements. I like talking in front of people in general. So, um, Well, I guess who wants to hear what I did in Africa? Yeah. Well, I didn't do nothing. So who wants to hear what God did in Africa? Yeah, that's a lot different. Um, so <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Uh, obviously, I wasn't always saved, but it's crazy to see what God can do uh, with people who are just willing to show up, you know. Uh, but 1,255 people got saved, Amen. which is nuts. Um, I mean, we got that box, you know, but yeah. nobody knows the condition of the heart, even if 10% of those people got saved. We already got that box checked off, so we got to raise, raise that. You know? um, but 31 pastors got saved, uh, which is pretty cool. <coughs> Man, you guys gave me the crud. <laughs> Sorry, though. Um, so if you believe in Jehovah over there, you're a Christian. If you believe in Allah, you're a Muslim. So, you know, they think Catholics and Seventh-day Adventists and all that other stuff, they just lump them all in together. So because of that, we got them all to come to discipleship courses and stuff. And uh, 31 of those pastors ended up getting saved out of uh, workspace salvation. Because they, yeah, they never, never heard how simple salvation is. Um, it's, it's amazingly simple. Uh, but the ripple effects of that are, are going to be huge because now they're going to go back and they're teaching the same thing and they're excited about it. Uh, so that's, that's really cool to see. Um, we would... Basically, just travel the travel the country, and at nighttime, we would still go out and show that uh, Jesus film uh, to anybody that wanted to see a movie. And you know, nobody sees movies over there, so that always draws a crowd. Um, but during the day, we'd be in a town uh, giving discipleship courses. Uh, the guy I went with was 28, 
And I got to tell you, I was, I'm pretty impressed with that guy. Like all of his teaching is straight biblical. Just it's, it's very impressive for a 28 year old. Um, yeah, he, he makes me look bad, you know, so I let him do all the talking. I was just a professional pack mule, I guess, but that, that worked out good. Um, there's always weird stuff. Like I ate actual chicken bones, you know, like if you go to KFC, that bone that'd be at the end, uh, you, you just eat it. It's, it's interesting. You chew it up, it turns into powder and it does all right, I guess. It's good for you. I don't know. Is my skin glowing? I, I don't know. You know? But those people have perfect teeth over there. So I'm like, man, these guys have got to be doing something right, you know. Um, but it was just a huge blessing. And, uh, man, you know, pride kind of comes in in the beginning. And you want to do everything by yourself. So, like, the finances for me getting over there, I was like, man, I got this this year. This isn't a big deal, you know. So I was, you know, doing things here and doing things there to just try to ensure I could do it. But God has a funny way of making sure that you can't do it on your own. Um, man, I should have learned that, like, Forty thousand dollars ago, but that's all right. You know, everybody pitched in. Every like the church with the mission funds. Uh, there's a lot of people that pitched in just on top of that, um, and it all it all went to good things. It all went to people's bellies over there, and people's minds, and people's hearts. So uh, we didn't use any of it on our on our on our own, but uh, that's all fruit to all your accounts. Uh, so that's that's a big big thing. So I appreciate everything you guys did. Uh, to help me get over there, um, and man, 1,255 people, that's, that's absolutely insane. Um, I was going to go to Honduras in about three weeks, but that's getting pushed back to the fall, uh, so I think the next thing coming up is uh, leaving at the end of May uh, to go to Georgia for a while and see what's happening. God's, God's working on my heart for a couple different things right now, so just seeing what doors he opens, but it's, it's all good. So. Uh, Appreciate all the help, and couldn't have done it without you guys. And if you want to know more, I'm definitely willing to tell you more, but I don't want to take stuff from the kids tonight, and that's my excuse to not talk up here anymore. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with that. But God does amazing things, and, I mean, that great commission, the first word is just go. You know what I mean? And if you just open your ears and eyes to that, it's amazing what he can accomplish. So that's it. All right. All right, thank you for that. And of course, your missions giving helps to be able to make those trips possible and to be able to support our missionaries, not just in Africa, but really around the world. When you think about it, I want you to consider tonight, having heard what you've just heard, uh, the testimonies of missionaries that we support back there on the, on the plaques in the different areas. We send money to them every month to get those same types of stories, to see people saved in countries yeah. all over the world. And if so, if you've ever thought that maybe it's not worth it to give to missions, well, you're wrong. It's very much worth it. God's doing a great work all across the world. Brother Caleb, come on up this way. Lead us in another hymn. If you would, stand with me. We'll receive the offering following this hymn. Would you please grab your hymnal and turn to hymn page 341. Victory in Jesus. came from glory yeah we gave his life on calvary to save a wretch like me i heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning then i, I repented of my sin and won the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then i cried 
my dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me love and glory. Beyond the crystal sea About the angels singing And the old redemption story And some sweet day I'll sing up there The song of victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior Sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He punched me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. If you would remain standing, we're going to receive the offering at this time. I'll have the two gentlemen, if you will, make your way back there and grab those offering plates and we'll receive the offering. We also have a special group back there is going to be uh, uh, playing the offertory for us tonight. So I think there's a, a trumpet and a guitar and a ukulele and a violin. And so they'll be playing that offertory tonight, and that'll be good. And looking forward to that. Those young men are going to grab those offering plates, and then they'll come up to the front. And uh, looking forward to a great, great night tonight. Aren't you thankful we have some youth? Willing to step up to the plate and lead the service occasionally and kind of head that up. Guys, those offering plates are on the back table back there. There we go. All right. And I'm so thankful, but I'm glad that they are going to be heading up things tonight and preaching and leading the singing. It's a blessing to see what the youth of Victory Springs are growing up to be. And uh, they're growing up and maturing into some wonderful young people. Look at Brother Roger back there running the live stream. Used to be one of our young men and just slowly growing and maturing. Amen. And taking over different parts and valuable parts of our ministry. And so I'm th so thankful for these young people and what they mean to the Lord and to us as well. Let's go ahead and pray. Uh, the Lord Lord, will bless this offering time, then you may be seated. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for this offering time to where we can give to you and to your work. Lord, I pray that you bless it and use it for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Amen. Wasn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. That was great. Uh, we've got a special at this time. I asked the uh, three young people who sang a special this morning. I asked them to come back and sing that again tonight. And so I'd like to hear it again. If you don't want to, that's fine, but I want to. And uh, so since I'm leading tonight, I get to hear it again. And so they're going to make their way this way. Then right after that, we'll have our first preacher tonight. Jesus is dead Though they mock at his name And bring him to shame I believe all he has said I believe that Jesus lives And he alone can say I believe he bled and died, and he rose up from the grave. I believe his word is true, and makes a firm foundation. I believe his precious blood can bring salvation. In a day when Satan seems to win, in a day when men fall away, in this time of confusion and sore disillusion, as Christians we must all say, I believe that Jesus lives and he alone can save. I believe they went and died, and he rose up from the grave. I believe his word is true and makes a firm foundation. I believe his precious blood can bring salvation. I believe his word is true and makes a firm foundation. I believe his precious blood can bring salvation. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord for that. What a good song that is. We've got it this time. Uh, Brother Micah, if you'll make your way this way, he's going to preach first tonight. And I think you're tall enough to not have to use the stool. And uh, if you can't see his head, then you just yell and we'll put him up on the stool. But I think you're tall enough now. Amen. Looking forward to the message. Luke chapter 11. Tonight I'm going to be preaching on the power of prayer. In the Bible, there are many miracles that happen because of prayer. Daniel prayed three times a day, even though the king said only to pray to him. Daniel, Daniel 6.10 says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem, in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did before time. So basically, Daniel, um, Daniel, the king made a, made a rule that um, if you, if you prayed to any other God and if you didn't pray to his God or him, that you would be thrown into the lion's, into the lion's den. And when they threw him into the lion's den, the Lord stopped the lion's mouths. And there was that time in the Bible when that boy was working outside with his dad, and he said, my head, my head. So his father carried him inside and sat him on his mother's lap. And later that night, he died. So, so his mother went to go see the prophet Elijah. 2 Kings 4, 32 through 33 says, And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. 
And, and he went in, therefore, and shut the door upon him twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And after that, the boy came back to life. That's only two times in the Bible, out of many times, that miracles and great things have happened because of one person's prayer. Amen. Right. And by the way, prayer didn't only work in the Bible. It still works nowadays. Amen. God commands us to pray multiple times in the Bible. The, the Bible says the word pray 313 times. Here's just a couple times in the Bible where God commands us to pray. Mark 13.33 says, take, take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Luke 10.2 says, Therefore he said unto them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers unto his harvest. Luke 11.1 1 says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased one of them, he, he, one of his disciples, he said unto them, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And Luke, 10, two, Luke 11, 2 says, And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. In the Bible, Jesus prayed multiple times. He, he taught his disciples how to pray in the verses before, and he prayed on the Mount of Olives, and many other times the Bible is recorded. When we get up every morning, God is, is excited to meet with us and talk with us. Right. Every day, God wants to fellowship with you, and he enjoys fellowshipping with you. Right. Prayer helps your relationship with God and helps you to be more Christ-like. Having a prayer, prayer life is very vital in our Christian life, Amen. and we should pray every day. Having a personal relationship and have a personal relationship just like Daniel even when the king threatened to throw him into the lion's den. When we pr pray, remember this, the love of God that wants what's best for us, the wisdom of God that knows what's best for us, and the power of God that can, can accomplish it. Good. Number one, prayer has the power to heal. Yeah. All prayer is is talking to God and asking, at, and asking him. If you ask God, he can heal you. Look at Luke chapter 11 and look at verse 9. Look at verse 9 and it says, I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek, seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto Amen. you. Dr. Helen Rosevere, missionary to Zaire, followed, told the following story. A mother at her mission station died after giving birth to a premature baby. We tried to... In, in, we tried to improvise an incubator to keep the infant alive, but the only hot water bottle we had was beyond repair. So we asked the children to pray for her sister, and for the baby and her sister. One of the girls responded, Dear God, please send a hot water bottle today. Tomorrow will be too late because then the baby will be dead. And dear Lord, please send a doll for the sister so she won't feel, that, feel so lonely. That afternoon, a large package arrived, and much to their surprise, under some clothing was a hot water bottle. Amen. Immediately, the girl who pr had prayed so earnestly started to dig deeper, exclaiming, If God sent that, I'm sure he also sent a doll. And she was right. The Heavenly Father knew in advance of the child's sincere request, and five months earlier, he led a ladies' group to incline both of those specific articles. George Mueller was known for his powerful prayer life. Once on his way to speak in Quebec for an engagement, he informed the captain he needed to be in Quebec by Saturday afternoon. As the captain related his story, he said, It is impossible, I said. Do you know how dense the fog is? No, he replied. My eye is not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls the, the cir all circumstances of life. I have never broken an engagement for 57 years. Let us go down into the chart room and pray. He knelt and prayed one of the simplest prayers. I was going to pray after he did, but he put his hand on my shoulder and told me not to pray. As you do not believe, he will answer, he said. There is no need for you to pray about it. Get up, Captain, and open the door, and you will find that the fog has gone. The fog indeed was gone, and George Mueller kept his Amen. engagement. Last, 
A tale was told of a small town that had been historically dry, as in without alcohol or any liquor. But then a local businessman decided to build a tavern. A group of Christians from a local church were concerned and planned an all-night prayer meeting to ask God to intervene. It just so happened that shortly thereafter, lightning struck the bar and burned it to the ground. The owner of the bar sued the church, claiming that the prayers of the congregation were responsible. But the church hired an, a lawyer to argue in, the, in court that they were not responsible. The presiding judge, after his initial interview of the case, stated that no matter how the case comes out, one thing is clear. The tavern owner believes in the prayers and the Christians do not. <laughs> Number two, prayer has the power to conquer our enemies. If we have an enemy or a problem in our life, God can conquer it. Yeah. We just have to ask. That's right. Joshua, please, please turn to Joshua. Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10, and then look at verse 12. It says, And spake Joshua unto the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand now still upon Gibeon, and, and, thou, the, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Joshua ten thirteen, And the sun stood still, and the moon moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies and it is in is not this written in the book of Jasher so the sun stood still in the midst of of heaven and hasted not to go down a whole day Joshua 10:14 and there was no day like like that before it or after it that the Lord had hearkened unto a, a voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel and Joshua returned into all Israel with him unto the camp of Gilgal. Basically, in these verses, Joshua was fighting with the Israelites, with the, Joshua was fighting with the Amorites, and the sun was going down, and it was going to be dark soon. So Joshua said for the sun and moon to stand still, and it happened. And if if there is an enemy and a problem in your life, God can take care of it. Amen. If God can conquer death in the grave, then he can surely conquer our problems too. Right. Nothing is too hard for God to do. Yeah. Number three, it has the, prayer has the power to save. That's right. Romans 10 verse 9 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the Bible, the Lord says that all you have to do is call, up, ask, call upon the Lord and ask the Lord to come into your heart and save you. So number one, prayer has the power to heal. Number two, prayer has the power to conquer our enemies. And number three, prayer has the power to save. Thank you. Amen. What a good message. How many times do we not take advantage of prayer? Of prayer. What if I what if I told you that God said that in your lifetime you have one miracle ask where you could go and you could ask God for anything and he would do it and you get one of those in your lifetime. As soon as you get saved, God gives you one of those miracle asks and you can just put it in your back pocket and you can pull it out at any time. And whenever you're ready, you can use that. Wouldn't that be an incredible thing? And God's given you unlimited miracle asks. Yeah. Unlimited. Right. And the problem is, is how many times are we asking for miracles, right? Good stuff. Prayer has the power to heal. Prayer has the power to conquer our enemies. Prayer has the power to save. Amen. Brother Caleb, come on up. Lead us in one more hymn, then we'll get to our last preacher for tonight. Would you please stand with me and grab your hymnal? hymnal? Turn to page 341. Victory in Jesus. 485. 
pronounce that number again. Four eight. Four eighty five. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel my home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I take me through, through, I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I have a loving Savior up in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I can stand. He's waiting now for me in heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shores. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We have another preacher at this time, Brother Silas, if you would make your way. And uh, Brother Babson, he'll be using that lapel. And uh, But amen. Come on up this way and preach for us, brother. Good evening. Go and turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 13 is where we'll be at tonight. Numbers chapter 13. If you're not sure where Numbers is at, Numbers is the fourth book of your Bible. We'll be in Numbers chapter 13 and verse number 17. Numbers chapter 13 and verse number 17. We'll be reading down um, through verse number 20. And the Bible says, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land, now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. In this story, if I'll take you on a backtrack, they have just they have gone through Egypt. Remember the slavery and the bondage of having um, to go through Egypt, where they were under persecution for what they thought was right. And they went, and now God has brought them through the wilderness, to which they have journeyed to a promised land. If you don't know what the promised land is, the promised land was the land of Canaan that God had given them, and God had promised for them to dwell in, and God had promised for them to be in. And it was a rich land. It was a land that, in the Bible says, a land flowing with milk and honey. If you look in the promised land, the promised land and a successful Christian life have many similarities. They have very many similarities. Um, however, if you look in um, Numbers chapter 14, there was a point where the children of Israel were close to being in the promised land. They were right up against it. But for some reason, in about a chapter and a couple of verses, 
they all of a sudden they didn't go to the promised land. Um, go and turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14, verse number 29. Numbers chapter 14, verse num number 29. We'll read down to verse number 31. And it says, Your carcasses um, shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. So in Numbers chapter 13, we see the excitement, you see the anticipation of getting ready to go in the promised land. You look up a chapter later in Numbers chapter 14, and all of a sudden God is giving him, God um, is showing his wrath, God is showing his displeasure in something that they have done. But what is this? And if you see um, in the Bible, you can see where God's punishment, God's judgment for them, is that they'd have to stay in the wilderness for another 40 years, and that they couldn't go into the promised land. And if you look, it'd eventually be their children that would go into the promised land. It would even be them. And what a sad judgment that God had given them. But um, I'd like to show you four things, the four reasons of why they didn't go in the pr uh, promised land. The four reasons of why God's judgment was upon them. And it will be the same four reasons of what will stop you from living a good, successful Christian life. Point number one, there was wrong company. Point number one, there is wrong company. The Bible has a lot to say about the company that you're in, the influences, and the friends that you have. Go and turn um, to the previous chapter, Numbers chapter 13, but this time in verse number 31. This time in verse number 31, we'll read through verse number 32. And it says, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and all the people that we saw it are men of great stature. The Bible has a lot to say about the company in, our, um, in a Christian's life. Right. The wrong influences in your life and the wrong friends that you hang around and that you have can destroy you but the right kinds of friends and if you get around the right influences they can help you do something great for God. Adam and Eve were influenced in the garden by the serpent which was Satan and it brought all of sin into the world. Lot was influenced by Sodom, um, the city, and his family and his morals paid the price for it. That's right. um, Abram was influenced by fear, and he lied to government. Isaac was influenced by Esau and had a favorite. Um, and we see many more instances of where we see influences and whether it be good or bad. And that's just in the first couple ch um, chapters of the Bible. There's over 1,100 chapters in the Bible. God has a lot to say about who we hang around. But what are the signs of a bad friend? You may think, okay, now we know that there's influences and there's certain influences we shouldn't hang around. But what are the signs, what are the earmarks, if you want to say, of a bad friend that we should stay clear of and that we should avoid? First, they'll give you the negative. They'll give you the negative. If you look in verse number 32 of chapter 13, it says, And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And if you see here, these evil, the evil men, the bad company in their lives, were the spies, these bad spies. And they gave them the negative. The wrong influences in your life are going to give you the negative. They're going to give you complaining. They're going to give you the bad side of everything and not try to lift up. They're not going to praise God about anything. They're going to complain about God. They're going to complain to you, and they're going to give that's a wrong thing, and you don't need to hang around that kind of person. Number two, they don't want you in the promised land. These, these evil spies, they wanted them to stay away from the promised land. And just like the promised land is a similarity between the Christian life, people that we don't need to hang around, are going to try to tell you, you don't need to live a Christian life. You can go yeah. live in the world. God would be pleased with that. And whatever you do, and go ahead and follow your heart. And that's not something we should um, take heed of. And number three, they want you to depend upon yourself. Number three, they want you to depend upon yourself. Wrong, the wrong company can hurt what we're doing for God, but a right friend will help beyond compare. They want you to depend upon yourself. Let's look at verse number 31. Verse number 31, it says, But the men that went, went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They want you to depend upon yourself and not God. They want you to think, be, have a proud, boastful spirit and think that you can do it or that you can't do it or think that um, everything depends upon yourself when ultimately everything that we do depends upon God. That's right. um, and look, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number 17.
Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number 17. It says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And let me tell you, since, we are, since all of us are human, all of us are influencing people. We're all having an effect upon people. Just like the Bible says, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. All of us know people, all of us see people. We're sharpening people, whether we like it or not. And the question is, how are we sharpening them? Are we sharpening them in a good way that God would be pleased with? Or are we sharpening them in a bad, negative way? How are the friends and influences sharpening you? Because not only do we sharpen people with our countenance in the way that we talk and we act, but people are also sharpening us. So number one, they had bad company. Number two, they belittled God. Number two, they belittled God. Go ahead and see verse number 31. We'll read that again. It says, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. We in our lives must learn to depend upon God and not ourselves and what we think we can do. They didn't fail in their journey. God wasn't displeased with them until they tried doing things on their own, until they changed their mindset of God leading us to we leading us. The minute you try to do things by yourself, the minute you think that you give credit to yourself and think that you can do it and that you can live this life without God's help is the minute that you will fail doing anything successful. Samuel Morse was born into a preacher's home in New England just two years after George Washington was elected president of the United States. After finishing his education at Yale College, he went um, back home to, his, to England to hone in on his painting skill, which he had a very, he was a very gifted artist. And um, after going back to America, his, his paintings were in much demand. However, Mor Morse's first wife died while he was away from home painting in Washington, D.C. In this grief, he, re he received the news until it was too late. In his heartbreak, he turned away from painting and began trying to develop a means of rapid communication over great distances. This eventually led to the discovery of the telegraph. Despite his fame and many honors for making this huge technological advance, um, he was known to be a very humble man, not proud or boastful or arrogant, but known to be a very humble guy. In a letter to his second wife, he wrote, and I quote, the more I contemplate this great undertaking, the more I feel my own littleness, and the more I perceive the hand of God in it, and how he is assigned to various persons their duties, he being the great controller, all others his honored instruments. Hence our dependence, first of all, on God, then on each other. I think Samuel Morse got it on who we should depend upon. I like when he said, all others his honored instruments. The Bible has a lot to say about how we can be like an instrument. And God, if we let him, he can play, and if you'll let him play through your life and do what he wants, and we just be the instrument, we don't try to play ourselves, because if anybody knows anything, an instrument can't play by itself. But if we let God and play, he can create the most beautiful piece of music that we could have never done ourselves. Psalm 34 eight says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blesses the man that trusteth in him. The question is, what are you trusting in tonight? God says, blessed, blessed is the man that trusteth in God. Sometimes it's easy as Americans to say that, oh, we trust God, but ultimately we have luxury and it's harder than some, some, than some countries. We have a roof over our head. We have a car that we drive. We have money. It's not like we're in too much necessarily of a dire need to trust God for our needs. But ultimately, what are we trusting in tonight? Cory Ten Boom, if you don't know who Cory Ten Boom, um, Cory Ten Boom, we have her biography at the table. It's called The Hiding Place. Cory Ten Boom was a famous person and she was known for being in the Holocaust in World War II and living in a German prison. And her biography, which is on the table, gives her accounts about living in the Holocaust and living and being um, subdued by the Germans, and living in a prison camp, and in a concentration camp. She was often known to say that she said to always trust a known God for the unknown ahead. Trust a known God for the unknown ahead. So we see, number one, they had bad company. Number two, that led to them belittling God. Number three, they looked back. Number three, they looked back. Go and turn to the next chapter of Numbers, ch Numbers chapter 14. Go back with me to Numbers chapter 14 and verse number one. <coughs> numbers chapter 14, we'll start in verse number one and read down through verse number four. In verse number one, it reads, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? 
And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. As soon as the trial set in, as soon as the judgment had came down, as soon as the hard place that the children of Israel encountered, they immediately wanted to look back towards Egypt. Egypt in the Bible times was the worldly place. It was their past where they had been in bondage and they had been in slavery for Egypt. Egypt was known to be a place of luxury and to have um, a good time there. But it is where they were slaves. And it is where God had gotten them out of it to give them the promised land. But however, when the trials came in their life, they quickly forsook God for the bondage of Egypt. Egypt looked, sure, sure looked nice on the outside. It had the luxury. It had the pleasure. It had what, everything that the common man would want. But on the inside, for the children of Israel, it was a place of bondage. It was a place of slavery. We will never make it for God if when the trial comes in our life and when the hard time and the thing where we need to ultimately trust God comes in our life, if we, we're quick to run to the world, we're quick to covet to the world. That's not the kind of attitude we need to have. Hmm. Two boys were playing in the snow one day. One, one said to the other, Let us see who can make the straightest path in the snow. His companion readily agreed and accepted the proposition, and they started. One boy fixed his eyes on a tree and walked along without taking his eyes off the object that he had selected. The other boy set his trees on or, I'm sorry, set his eyes on the tree also, and we had gone a short distance, he turned and looked back to see his progress and how true was his course, and looked back at the beginning spot. He went a little distance further and again looked over back at his steps. He did this many times, and when they arrived at their stopping place, each halted and looked back to see who had the straightest path in the snow. One path was as true as could be, was as true as an arrow, while the other path was all rickety and all a zigzag course. How did you get your path so true? asked the boy who had made the crooked steps. Well, I said the other boy, I just set my eyes on the tree and kept them there until I got to the end, while you stopped and looked back and wandered out of your course. This can be a perfect picture. This example can be a perfect picture of the Christian life. We need to fix our eyes, not on the world, not on the job, not on the career, but we need to fix our eyes on the hope and the trust and our faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, <clears throat> And when, so when they were looking back at the world, it says that they looked back. When they were looking at the world, when they were looking at coveting the world, and, um, which was Egypt, they complained about God, they doubted God. Nothing was ever restored with, with God and the relationship of them and God. Nothing ever was helped, and the situation only got worse. When your focus is set on the world and your focus is set on sin, nothing ever good produces out of it. Right. Let me ask you tonight, how is your focus? Is your focus on worldly things that's going to eventually put you in the bondage of sin? Or is it on Christ who can take us out of the bondage of sin? No, we saw number one. Point number one, they had bad company. Number two, they belittled God. Number three, they looked back. And lastly, number four, they looked at the giants instead of the blessings. They looked at the giants instead of the blessings. If you'll turn with me uh, one more time in the same chapter of Numbers chapter 13 and verse number 32. Verse number 32, it says, And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we see in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so, were, so we were in their sight. First, I want to show you a look at the giant. The giant, it was probably, it was probably scary to see these huge, tall people. They were known, um, in, it, said, it says in the Bible, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we're in their sight. So you see this giant, you see this obstacle in their path of the promised land. It was their job to get rid of the giant, and it's your job to get rid of the giant in your life. However, it wasn't their job to do it alone. God never intended for them to do this by themselves. He had always offered his help. All they needed to do was ask. All of us will have giants in our life. We'll have obstacles that we need to face and obstacles that we need to get over. And if we ask God, he can help us get over these obstacles. Um, some of the Israelites, eventually 40 years later when they got into the promised land, and you remember Joshua with the walls came tumbling down, and we see that 40 years later, um, even when they went in and they got in the promised land, some of, some of the tribes didn't get rid of the giants out of the land. And we can see... 
books later in the Bible, we can see many, many pages later in the Bible, they're still dealing with people like the Philistines and many other giants that they never got rid of. When you don't get rid of the giants and the hard things out of your life, and sometimes the giants of sin out of your life, it will haunt you in, your genera in generations to come. There's giants we need to get out of our heart, in our habits, in our lifestyle. We need to get rid of the giant of no separation. A, the, some people and sometimes there's a generation of Christians coming up that think let's live like the world let's have all the fun and the worldly pleasures let's not hold to any of God's standards as long as we're doing something for God as long as we say we're Christians we can have all the fun that the world has and that's not something we need to have that's not a giant we need to have in our life and in our promised land a giant of not having a relationship with God thinking God is pleased with us if, if we don't pray to him and if we don't read our Bibles and thinking God is happy with that he's not happy with that at all the giant of laziness, selfishness, pride. There are many giants in our life and many giants that there can be in our life. It is now that we need to get rid of the giants in our life. It is now that we need to get those wrong things before they mess us up even further. Satan wants you to mess up your life and he puts those giants in place so you can mess up your life. Why didn't the children of Israel, they didn't conquer the giants, but why didn't they conquer the giants like they were supposed to and God um, commanded of them? It could have been the giant of fear. They may be worried and scared at the thought of having to face this big giant. They could have gotten killed. They were probably worried about it. Satan may use the giant of fear in our own lives to keep us doing things that we should do. He'll, keep, um, he'll use the giant of fear to keep us from serving God. When the pastor asks you, hey, can you do this for me or can you lead this for me? And we say no. We're quick to say no. Why? Because we're nervous. Why? Because we may be scared. That's not something that we need to have in our lives. Fear is no excuse not to serve God. Um, Satan can use the giant of fear in our lives not to go soul winning. We may go to pull out a, um, a gospel track and give it to somebody at the gas station or somebody at the grocery store, but then we pull it back thinking eh, maybe they don't want it, they probably wouldn't like that. We, that is never excuse as well not to soul winning by having our fear. It could have been the giant of their focus. They backed out of going into the promised land when their focus was on the giant, when their focus was on the negative things. If they would have just simply kept their eyes on God and kept their eyes on the blessings and what God had promised them and God had told them that they could subdue those giants, if they would have kept their eyes and their focus on that, then they could have gotten to the promised land. But because of their focus on the giant and on the wrong and on the things that they couldn't handle, that's when they failed. Though, we would, though he would later be acclaimed as one of the greatest inventors of history, Thomas Edison's school career only lasted three months. The teacher believed he was incapable of learning anything whatsoever um, and sent him home. Edison's mother taught him, and he was eventually homeschooled throughout his um, childhood. And he was on his way to a lifetime of overcoming insurmountable obstacles. Among his most famous inventions were the light bulb as we have it today, was the fluoroscope, and the phonograph. Most of his inventions required months, if not years, of hard work and dedication and overcoming obstacles and trials that was in his path to discovering these great inventions. In a 1921 interview, when he was older, Edison described his persistence this way, and I quote, after, he had con after we had conducted thousands of experiments on a certain project without solving the problem, one of my associates, after had conducted the crowning experiment, and it proved a failure, expressed discouragement, and he expressed disgust over our having failed to find out anything whatsoever. I cheerily assured him that we had learned something, for we had learned for a certainty that the thing couldn't be done that way, and that we would have to try some other way. Thomas Edison was known as a man of persistence. He was known as a man that would keep going, and a man that would face the trials that came in his life. We have a generation of Christians that, we, that have no effort. They don't put any effort into the things of God. When they, when they don't see results, they give up. We can't give up because we have a world that is dying and going to hell. We have a world that is on a place of destruction, in a place that has an eternity, in a place that God doesn't want them to be. And if we don't have any effort, if we don't try, if we don't try to face these obstacles that Satan's putting our way, then we'll never be able to reach, and we'll never be able to reach these people, and never be able to do anything for God. So let me ask you tonight, is there anything hindering us from living a good Christian life like God wants us to have? Is there any bad company that we need to get out, uh, out of our lives? Are we belittling God and trying to trust in ourselves to get things done? Are we looking back to the world and coveting of what the world has? Are we dwelling on the giant instead of the blessings? Tonight, let's live a life in the promised land like God intended for us to have. Enjoy the rich blessings of living a good Christian life.
Alice, wonderful job. If I could get a lady to the piano, and uh, what a great message. You know, that promised land life is, uh, that promised land, as he said is in the Old Testament, is a picture of that victorious Christian life. That life right. you want to live as a Christian, that's what it's a picture of. And just because you crossed the Jordan, just because you got saved, amen, and you get in, hey, that doesn't mean all the signs of giants just fall down, and you never have any problems, and you never have any struggles. Just because you get saved doesn't mean life is now going to be just miracle whip, and that'd be awful. And uh, it doesn't mean it's going to be whipped cream and, and, and cherries, and I mean, it's just going to be wonderful. No, it's going to be tough. There's going to be some hard things. But the question is, I love that last point, what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the blessings of salvation, or are you focused on those giants that are going to stand in your way? Giants can always be conquered. Giants can always be conquered. Never saw a giant in Scripture that couldn't be conquered. I, I saw all of them get conquered. And uh, God did an incredible work there. So a great job, Brother Silas and Brother Micah. I'm sure if you listen tonight that the Lord has spoken to your heart about something, and if you keep the ink wet on your surrender, I promise you then the Lord has something that he gave to you tonight. If you would stand with me with heads bowed and eyes closed, we'll have a short time of invitation for you to be able to deal with the Lord as he spoke to your heart and touched it. And I only ask tonight that you'd be faithful to deal with the Lord as he has touched you. Maybe he pointed something out in your life. He gave a, a great list in that message. Maybe you're dealing with the issues of separation. Maybe you're dealing with issues of uh, that relationship with God and reading your Bible and praying. Maybe it's a laziness or selfishness or pride or fear or soul winning. What is it that the Lord dealt with you tonight? Would you get it right? fail if we would forget tonight to ask the question this evening if there's anyone in here tonight who has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They've never had that time where they've said, Jesus, I want to place my faith and trust in you to be my Savior. Maybe they've been trusting in, on, in works and things of that sort that Brother Nate talked about earlier in his update. But is there anyone here tonight who would say, you know what, Brother Josh, if you were to ask me, I don't know for sure if I would go to heaven when I die. I've never been saved before. You say, that's me. No one's looking around. You say, but I'll raise my hand and I'll be honest. I, I don't know if I would go to heaven when I die. You say, that's me. Would you please pray for me? Is there anyone like that in here tonight? How many of you could say with an uplifted hand and say, you know what? I've had that time where I've asked Jesus to be my Savior. If I died today, I know from the Bible that I would go to heaven. You say, that's me. You raise your hand high in the air so I can see it. Amen. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful testimony. You've been saved. Live for the Lord. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight and this service where we've been able to see the youth do many wonderful things in the service. Lord, we pray that you continue to have your guiding hand of protection upon them, that you would help them to continue to follow you, that you'd protect them from the enemy and Satan who wants to destroy them. Lord, I pray that you keep them in the fight for you. Help us tonight. Lord, help those that are sick and unable to make the services this evening. I pray that you'd please help them as they make their way back in. Lord, bless our service even tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Lord, I pray that you give us a wonderful service together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Right after the service for any of the teenagers and any of the youth, there will be something over in the youth center for you. So I want you to go over there and get it. And uh, you'll see what it is over there when you get over there. All right. So I do have Mrs. Peel's going to make a quick announcement before we finish tonight. No, I'm not going to preach. All right. All right. I know it's been a busy day, especially for mamas if you have children. But I would like Mrs. Jimenez... And Mrs. Tabitha Jimenez to come forward, please. <laughs> it's been a long day, I know, but turn around and look at all these wonderful faces. <laughs> well, most of us in here already know, but I don't know if it's a secret or not, but Ma 
She looks confused, so it must be a secret. March is Pastor's Wife Appreciation Month. Did you know that? It is, and we got it in on the last day of the month, and you're both healthy and upright, so we're doing good. All right, so when we started talking about it, the ladies in this church, you can look at me, it doesn't matter, jumped right in, and they were so excited to do something for you to show you their love. You got, I'm going to say guys, because that's just what I say, but you girls faithfully serve, serve, and serve some more, all of us in, in this church. But you serve with a smile. Amen. You serve with a joyful heart. I'm not going to say that there's never a, you know, <laughs> you know, men, you know, right? <laughs> but honestly, they're so joyful and they're so giving and that just means a lot. That speaks volumes. Um, probably every lady in here could give a testimony of what these ladies have meant to you. Amen. Something they've done, a word they said, encouragement when you needed it, love, a phone call, a text, whatever. They have been there time and time again for all of us. And that really means a lot. Because of what you, you, have poured into us. We were so excited to come together and to pour back a little bit into you guys tonight. And what Silas said in the sermon, I was like, yeah, preach that. Because it was kind of like what I wanted to say and I didn't know how to say it, so he already said it for me. But iron does sharpen iron. And I feel sharper, <laughs> not mentally, but sharper <laughs> from deal talking with these ladies. I'm sure many of you would say the same thing. They are sharpening us in our service for the Lord. In our attitudes, in our desires, they are sharpening us. And that is a beautiful thing. A few days ago, don't know if you felt it or not, a few days ago, we all did a concerted effort to pray multiple times for you throughout the day. So I don't know if you felt it, but we were praying for your health, and for your encouragement, for your relationships, all of that. And so honestly, it was an answer of prayer to me when I walked in and y'all were healthy and y'all were here. So we have been praying for you. And I hope that you felt it. Um, Ms. Tracy, we have some roses for you. We just celebrated nine years anniversary. So Miss Cammie has nine roses. And I believe you've been the assistant pastor's wife for seven years. So you have seven roses. And I've been trying to keep them alive since yesterday. So now they are your responsibility. <laughs> we also chipped together and we're hoping you can have a romantic night away with your groom and with your groom and probably a few meals thrown in there and whatever. So the ladies really showered you with some love. I'm sure Pastor Jimenez and Brother Jimenez know that they couldn't be what they are without you behind them the whole, the whole way. So we want to encourage, encourage you tonight and let you know that we love you. So happy Pastor's Wife Appreciation Month. We do greatly appreciate you. Well, thank you so much to the ladies on behalf of my uh, behalf of my wife. I want to thank you for doing that. I had no clue, had no idea. I didn't know. Did you know this was a thing? As no, far as a pastor's wife appreciation month, did not, and I did not know that was a thing. So I just found out. And uh, but anyway, I'm going to pass it over to preacher now. I'm sure he's going to dismiss you. But uh, for the youth, I do want you to go to the back in the youth center here in just a little bit and make sure to get that thing. And amen. Uh, amen. <laughs> um, I made a I made a comment to someone today. I remember who it was in here and uh, talking about all the sicknesses that have been going around. And you know, my bride is on a transplant medicine that wipes out her immunity and it's very dangerous for her because she doesn't have an immunity to be able to fight sickness and uh, i made a comment to someone in here i remember who it was and i said you know what's amazing is i said out of all of us she got sick the least and i said i have no idea how she does that i do now you all don't know what you did for my bride this month in a time where sickness ravished our family 
you all kept her going behind the scenes. And I just say thank you so much for praying for your preacher's wife and for the assistant pastor's wife as well. But thank you for praying. Praise the Lord uh, for that. Uh, listen, now here's what I would love for you to do as well. I want you to look around. We've got a lot of folks missing church, a lot of folks sick. Normally our Sunday night, we're packed out. And so it just tells you there's a lot of things going on, a lot of sicknesses. I want you to find someone that's not here tonight, and would you check on them? Would you call them? Uh, maybe they need maybe they need some chicken soup, Mrs. Beasley. Amen. All right. And uh, but would you do that? Would you find someone tonight that's not here? And would you call them? Would you check on them? See if they need anything. And if they need anything, please let me know uh, or Josh know so that we can be a blessing to them. But please help us care for our own and make sure that everybody's checked on. A lot of folks missing tonight. So please get on the phone, a little text. Let them know you love them. Hey, God bless you. We love every single one of you. Tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Amen. Who knows? I might be out with my wife. I don't know. I don't know. No, just kidding. Tomorrow night, 7 p.m. We'll